All right. So welcome, welcome. My name is Casey. I am actually a nurse and I work for Trusted Health on the community marketing team. I'm really, really excited to have you here with us today for Nursing in the Wild Basic Survival Skills. I'm also part of the WMS. I'm very, very happy to announce um, as of recently. So I am, this is something that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and get started. A few things. I've already mentioned this, but please ask and upvote your questions in the Q&A section. If you look over on the right-hand side in the chat area, you're going to see up at the top, there's a Q&A button. If you want to click that, that will take you into a Q&A section where we ask that you place your questions there so we don't get them lost in the chat. You will also see that you can upvote other questions that you see that are asked there, so we know that you also want those answered. Um, and you'll also see DMs on the right-hand side. So if you're having any issues or want to ask me something personally, feel free to DM me there. Um, we're here to listen, learn, and connect and obtain your toolkit for survival situations, which I'm really excited about. And agenda. We're going to talk about the case study, eight steps to survival, and then we'll have our Q&A at the end. And before we get started, um, off over to Ms. Kelly George from the WMS. She's going to talk a little bit about the Wilderness Medical Society, and then we're going to play a short video so you can get an idea of what they offer. And it is amazing. Thank you, Casey. We're so excited to have you as a WMS member now. Um, but just a little bit about WMS for you guys that might not be familiar. Um, the Wilderness Medical Society is the largest nonprofit in the world dedicated to wilderness medicine. We've got about 4,200 members from 45 countries. And um, basically, you know, we've got nurses, nurse practitioners, PAs, physicians, paramedics, EMTs, ski patrol. Um, but one thing that everyone has in common is that they, it's people that want to combine their profession with their passion. Um, we have five main pillars that are education, membership, research, conferences, um, and the academy, which oversees our fellowship program, the Fellowship in the Academy of Wilderness Medicine, uh, our diplomas. We have one in mountain medicine and one in diving and marine medicine. Um, in 2022, we're looking forward to launching our first hybrid conferences that we're going to have options to connect online or in Jackson, Wyoming for our winter conference or Snowmass, Colorado for our summer conference. So we'd love to see some of you guys there. We're really excited and looking forward to those events. Um, but basically, whether you prefer the mountains, the deserts, the beach, woods, um, whatever environment, our mission is to help inspire you to be alive in the wilderness. Here's a quick video to show you what I mean. We believe the wild keeps us alive. We stand for kindness, service, inclusivity, education, and nature. We elevate others as we climb. We see the need and fill the gap. We look to uproot barriers, not trees. We seek knowledge and pay it forward. We find our way in the wild. We are the Wilderness Medical Society, a community of medical professionals devoted to facilitating high quality care in the outdoors. Our global membership and world renowned experts affirm our collective authority to set clinical standards and disseminate the most comprehensive array of wilderness medicine knowledge. Our innovative programs, publications, research, and certifications equip you with the tools to practice in any environment on or off the planet. Healthy lives are nurtured in wild places. Join us on the adventure and truly come alive. So hopefully that gives you a better idea of what the WMS is and what we do. Um, we're just really appreciative of this partnership that we have with Trusted Health. Um, we've really enjoyed this webinar series on nursing in the wild. And one of those members that I mentioned of our 4,200 members is the fabulous Todd Miner. So I'm really excited to introduce him today. Um, he's a doc doctoral degree in education, has his fellowship in the Academy of Wilderness Medicine or FOM, and is a frequent uh, instructor for the WMS. So. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to him and he can tell you a little bit more about himself. Well, thank you, Kelly. Can you hear me okay? Yep. 
Excellent. All right. Um, well, first of all, I want to just reiterate um, the wonderful nature of WMS. Um, I, I'm not a physician, and I was a little intimidated when I went to the first meeting, and um, I was just I was warmly embraced. It's a great organization. Uh, really friendly people. Uh, everyone's eager to share, and uh, I encourage you to check it out. Check out one of the conferences. It's, it's uh, you learn a ton and uh, meet some really cool people. So, a um, little bit about me. Um, I am um, probably the least credentialed medical person on this conference, on this um, instructional thing. Um, my background is the wilderness. Um, I served as a wilderness guide and outdoor educator in Alaska for a ton of years led expeditions all over the country, all over the world, and love uh, the outdoors, love um, wilderness medicine, and um, am particularly interested in survival. Um, I used to teach it at the University of Alaska and at Cornell University, and uh, got to experience lots of survival um, um, exploits myself. Um, and so uh, what, we've, what I've got here today is a case study that um, is a not too atypical situation um, that uh, you could um, end up uh, being involved in. And what I'm hoping you'll do is uh, read this case study, uh, try to picture yourself in the environment, and your goal is to choose the 10 items uh, in a prioritized order that's going to keep you alive. What What is it, what uh, can you retrieve that will um, help you keep rolling. So let's go ahead and take a look at the case study. Uh, Casey, if we can move on here, thanks. All right, so basically you guys are, we're in Southeast Alaska, you're flying uh, into uh, for a ski trip, uh, backcountry tent camp, um, and uh, you've run into some bad weather. Next slide. Uh, your plane crashes and uh, the pilot's killed, uh, the plane begins to burn. You escape with some some injuries uh, and only the clothes on your back. You're able to retrieve um, uh, some items. And here, here there's going to be a list here of what you can retrieve. Uh, but let's just uh, look quickly here at the situation. Um, you were just dressed in basically street clothes uh, on the way in there. Um, it is mid-February, about 3 p.m., um, and uh, the weather is not the best, as, as we talked about. Next slide. Uh, so you've crashed on the side of a mountain. You're in typical Southeast Alaska temperate rainforest, um, nothing but trees and light brush. Uh, you don't know exactly where you are other than you were flying for about an hour out of Juneau, Alaska. Uh, you're not sure if the pilot got off any kind of distress signal or if the emergency locator transmitter, the ELT, worked or survived the fire. The plane bursts into flames. You're able to save some items. And what your goal here is, um, let's go ahead and move to that next slide. You've got a choice of uh, 10 items that you can choose from this that you were that you might be able to recover. What is going to keep you alive? So what you want to do is, um, if you've got a chance, take a cell phone picture of this. If you don't have that email that was sent out earlier, just so you've got this whole list in front of you. Um, and you're going to, what you want to do is um, choose the 10 most important things and prioritize th them in order as to what's most important. So uh, the first thing on your list will be the, the most important thing down to number 10. Um, that's what that's what uh, your your goal is here. So you're going to um, put yourself to work. It's um, one, we're going to give you 10 minutes and we'll check back in to see where you are on that. And if need be, we can add another five. That sound good, Casey? Sounds great. We went through that pretty quick. So um, I'm going to progress to, oops, let me show you really quick. Um, this, and this has all the information. I know okay. that might have smaller screens. And so if you cannot see this, I did email it out to you already um, earlier today, the case study, and it has all of this information on it. So like he said, you have about 10 to 15 minutes to kind of prioritize those top 10 items that you're going to use, number one being the most important, 10 being the least important. Um, and then we'll check back in in about 10 yeah. minutes. Are you ready for me to um, 
go on into the yeah. next slide. Yeah. All right. Let's do it. I'm excited. All right. <laughs> all right. So here is the experts ranking. Uh, we'll see how you all did compared to this. Um, a um, big caveat is that I am the expert, though I have shared this with several other survival experts, uh, and uh, we're in uh, largely in agreement. I think we have a little bit different order, but the same things on the top 10. So um, let's, um, Casey, can you go to the next slide? Here are the two big, the big takeaways here, and that's what drives um, my ranking here and, and other experts is number one survival rule is stay put. So you can see all of the things that I've chosen um, are predicated on us staying put, hanging out there for a number of reasons, and then and staying together. Um, and then once we've done that, shelter signaling are the big two big things. And then there's some, some other issues as well. So uh, Casey, can we go back to that previous slide, please, the ranking? There we go. All right, so let's, let's um, take a look at these. I don't think we've got a more detailed uh, description. Yeah, let's, we'll just take this right from the top. So what's the big uh, challenge to our survival situation? It's hypothermia. It's, uh, we are right there at the really wet 35, 32 degree temperatures. Uh, it's going to be getting dark and um, it is, um, hang on one sec, I'm going to just close the door here. Um, sorry about that. I got some background noise. So did, while, while he's gone, did anyone get it right or was close to getting it right? If you can just put yes in the chat, I'm just curious because I, when I did this, I was completely wrong. All right, I'm back. Sorry about that. All the joys of um, presenting from one's home. All right, so uh, our big fear here is, is um, hypothermia. And so a tarp is immediate shelter from that sleet and rain. We can use it to wrap ourselves up, to cover ourselves. We can put everybody in a giant human burrito. Um, that tarp is uh, a huge, can be a huge um, uh, protection from, from both wind and particularly getting wet. Number two are flares. And this is going to be mainly for signaling. Um, aerial flares are gonna be able to project up. If we see a boat, we hear a plane, um, that is what uh, is gonna get it, uh, attention um, very, very efficiently. In addition, uh, a flare can be used to get a fire going. Um, uh, remember, we're in a rainforest here, a, a temperate rainforest, but a, a rainforest nonetheless. One of uh, my most embarrassing professional moments of many, many embarrassing professional moments was trying to uh, start a fire in front of students in Ketchikan, Alaska uh, many years ago. It took me 45 minutes to get a fire started, not with flint and steel, not with a bow drill, but with a lighter. Um, uh, it um, that everything is wet, everything is sodden. And with a flare, you've got some uh, accelerant there. So I would take my tinder, my really fine uh, things that I think are going to catch fire the easy easiest. I'd have some kindling, the next biggest pencil thin, pencil uh, thick in diameter and less, ready to go. I would build myself a little nest, and I would shoot a flare in one of the three flares into that, and I think that would get a fire going. I'll talk a little bit later about the importance of fire. It is, uh, it, it's, it can be extremely helpful, but it is not absolutely essential. Uh, but if you can get one going, it's it makes a big difference. Number three on my list are garbage bags. There's what a, I think a dozen of those garbage bags. They are instant rain shelters, instant ways to keep you off the wet. Uh, ground. Um, they can you get two per person, and um, that's going to be an additional uh, part of our shelter. And number four, raft. Again, um, mainly for shelter, um, whether you're putting people on top of it or once it's inflated or putting it over people. Um, it is a, um, uh, it, it's, again, protection from uh, particularly that wet, cold ground, getting people off of that. In addition, that raft can be, is us they're usually made out of bright colors, orange or yellow, uh, and that's going to show up. So it's a, it's a signaling device as well. And then something I, that I hadn't thought about that students in one of the classes I taught did, that uh, that raft's probably got a perimeter line around it 
that uh, could be that would be used for uh, getting sw helping swimmers get back into a raft or to get into the raft. And that rope could be used for lots of different things. And maybe there's a survival kit on the raft. Who knows? Um, it would be bonus. That would be icing on the cake. But um, might you might um, score some extra. Might be a knife in there. There might be dye. There might be water. Could be all kinds of things in a raft uh, survival raft survival kit. Number five is a sleeping bag. Now um, there's what five of us and there's one sleeping bag. So you know why would that be make our prioritized list? Well, um, who am I worried about in this situation? I'm worried about our two injured folks, right? The ones that can't move around, um, uh, the broken ankle or suspected broken ankle. That person's just going to be sitting there. Uh, they're probably going to be getting colder and colder. In addition. Uh, your friend that's got the significant burns, um, uh, partial thickness burns over extensive arms and hands, uh, that's going to, um, that person's not going to be doing a whole lot of moving around. Uh, uh, extensive burns are going to lead to dehydration, but, and in this situation, uh, increase significantly the chance of hypothermia. So I'm going to put my two injured people together in that sleeping bag, and that's, um, that's its purpose. Number six is a lighter. As I mentioned, fire is a wonderful uh, survival tool, um, but it is, um, it's not absolutely essential. So a lighter didn't, isn't my number one top uh, list there. Uh, um, fire is mainly going to be helpful for us in this situation for signaling for uh, at nighttime uh, flames and during the day smoke. Um, Many people think about fire as staying warm in this cold February Alaska condition, but the reality is trying to stay warm around a campfire uh, through a night is, can be really miserable. Heat goes up, you're sitting on the ground or sleeping on the ground next to a fire, and very little of that heat actually benefits uh, survivors. Think about we're what, basically a 20 or 25 gallon bucket of water. And if you put a 25 gallon bucket of water next to a fire, it really isn't going to heat up significantly. Um, uh, yes, it um, adds a little bit of warmth, and maybe you could dry something out. But in essence, in reality, it's mainly signaling. And then, second most important part about fire is the psychological aspect: that sense of control over one's environment, of being able to illuminate the night. Um, you know, uh, animals really aren't a risk factor, but psychologically people worry about that. Fire gives us kind of domain over that environment. And so psychologically, a fire can be really important. And it can also treat water. There's lots of other things uh, a fire can do. But our principal um, reasons that we're going to emphasize fire is signaling number one, psychologically number two, and then maybe staying warm or drying number three. But um, pr pretty tough there. The One of the things we like to emphasize is that if you can't get a fire going, don't freak out. Um, it is um, lots of, there's been lots, there's lots of stories in the survival literature where people were um, freaked out because they couldn't get a fire going. And again, getting fire going can be really tough. And so um, if you can't, it's, it's much better to conserve heat than it is to try to create external heat. Uh, and that's why shelter is so important. Shelter is more important than a fire. Um, and that we really emphasize that. Number seven on our list are the power bars. Uh, normally food on the survival uh, prioritization is uh, pretty low on our rankings, uh, but this is a whole case of power bars or energy bars, whatever you want to call them. Um, and what are we mainly worried about in this situation? That's hypothermia, so that the calories from those power bars are going to go a long way towards uh, preventing hypothermia in our, in our survivors. Number eight on our list is the saw. Um, when I used to teach survival in Alaska, um, we would, uh, conifer boughs were our number one shelter. Um, conifer boughs um, are great because when you cut them up and you, you can use them as a mattress, you can use them as a debris hut where you pile them up and you just kind of burrow into them. Um, they um, provide lots of dead air space and that's really what you want on for um, a survival shelter is, is dead air space. And so that saw, it's really hard to break conifer boughs, um, you know, spruce or pine boughs. 
Um, uh, with a saw though, you can cut them. Um, you could cut firewood, things like that. So that saw would be high up there. Number nine on my list is a rope. Um, the rope is going to be used mainly for helping to build shelter, but it can build a splint for an ankle. Um, modern climbing ropes are made out of nylon and nylon's a petroleum product. You burn nylon, it's going to burn black or gray dark smoke. So I would have a couple hunks of that rope pre-cut and I would be ready to be dumping them on the fire if I saw a plane going by, heard a boat going by um, uh, during daytime. So that rope would be also useful for signaling. And then number 10 is oil, uh, black gold, Texas tea. Um, oil uh, we're going to be using to mainly as an accelerant. Um, uh, it is, again, a petroleum product. And if you soak even that uh, moist wood that would be around in a temperate rainforest, uh, it can really help get that wood to burn. And um, that can be helpful. In addition, uh, the oil, as you might recall, came in a can. And that can could be very useful in a survival situation. Um, that can could be used to um, uh, heat, to melt snow, to heat water. Um, probably don't want to be uh, drinking water directly from a, a, a oily residue in a can. But if you take one of those plastic garbage bags and put it inside the, the can, uh, you've basically got a double boiler and you could boil water inside the, the uh, can without having the oil residue um, impact the, the, um, the, the water that you might be drinking and you could treat water that way if you needed to. All right, so those are my top 10. Um, I'll just briefly talk about some of the things that often show up in the top 10 that um, you may wonder why aren't on my list. And probably the one that's there, the most common is a cell phone. And, uh, you know, if you put that down there with the idea that maybe it might work, that's hard to argue with. Uh, in this case, you know, 95, 99% of Alaska cell phone coverage isn't going to work. Um, it is, uh, you need a cell phone tower and there just aren't those, they aren't around in the wilderness. So unfortunately, probably wouldn't work, but, um, you know, Maybe you added it there just on the chance that it did, and that's not a that's not a bad um, not bad thinking. Another item that's usually on the list from folks is a first aid kit, and you think, well, you know, we got two injured people, a first aid kit's going to be important. Uh, yes, um, it would be nice to have a first aid kit, but most first aid kits, the size of uh, a an industrial first aid kit, the size of a large uh, uh, hardback novel are going to be boo-boo kits, right? They're going to have band-aids. They might have a few ibuprofens. They might have a little bit of antibiotic ointment, um, uh, maybe some dressing, maybe some tape. Um, but it isn't going to make a big difference with somebody with a broken ankle or the kind of burns that uh, your friend has. So uh, it didn't, it wasn't high enough in my prioritization to make to make the top 10. Uh, water is another one that's often there. And again, we've got lots of water all around us in terms of sleet, snow, perhaps rain, um, all of that we can drink straight up without treating. Um, and uh, so there's no need for a filter, no need to, for water to, to make our list there. Uh, people sometimes put the GPS compass map, uh, but again, we're staying put. Um, we have no idea where we are, we have no idea where, which direction help is. Um, we've got two injured people. Uh, if staying put is, again, just a basic common, not common, a basic fundamental rule of survival, uh, you think about it, uh, they're gonna be looking for a crashed plane. If you're away from that, that's not gonna be helpful. Maybe the ELT, the electronic locator transmitter, went off. Maybe the pilot was able to get a, a mayday message off before uh, perishing. Um, all of those would bring the searchers directly or um, soon to the crash site. So you don't want to be leaving that. You're only going to get wetter, um, more tired, uh, more um, su uh, subject to hypothermia uh, by trying to travel in that kind of foot deep wet snow uh, through brush and things like that. So staying put is um, really the smart move here as it is in 99% of survival. Uh, stories. Um, all right, let's move. Let's move on and take a look at some just basic principles here, and then we'll talk about the eight steps to survival.
Um, can we actually have a question for you, Todd? I just saw it. Oh, like, yeah, you bet. Um, I think a couple of people were talking about um, like how long do you stay put before you start moving? Um, uh, sure. So a good question. Um, it would take it. It would. I wouldn't be moving for a day or two. That's for sure. But um, the average survival situation in Alaska. When I was um, at the University of Alaska, I did a study. It was 28 hours from start of survival situation to um, a rescue. The average search and rescue mission in U.S. national parks. So this is going, you know, broader. Is 26 hours. Remarkably close um, uh, in in amount of time. Uh, basically, if you can get through the night in most survival situations, if you're smart, you've left a trip plan, um, you're gonna get rescued by the next day. And so again, staying put is really the, the name of the game. There are these you know, stories like Alive. Some people may remember the story of the uh, Uruguayan rugby team that crashed in the Andes. Um, 30 or 40 years ago, uh, in the middle of a snowstorm, the plane was quickly buried in snow and um, the searchers weren't able to locate um, the, the survivors. Uh, there were, I can't remember how many survived, um, but they were there for weeks um, it, before they finally decided they had to go for help. Um, but that's that, that's a really unusual situation. So um, again, bottom line is stay put. At some point, yeah, you're gonna you may have to make a decision to um, head out. Uh, but that would be you know 24, 36, 48 hours or or more um, after because um, again, uh, you're you you'd be in a world of hurt in this situation, not knowing what direction to go um, in a in a rough terrain. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And then I have two questions. Two questions. We're going to do fa rapid fire um, before Great. we move on. Um, would you be concerned about the garbage bag melting in the double boiler setup? Uh, only if it gets it. As long as it's in the water, no. It you know if it gets out of the water, if it's hanging, it, you'd have to cut it carefully. Um, but no, it it will not melt in the water. Perfect. And then, how about collecting snow so that it melts as far as a water source? So I'd use one of the plastic garbage bags. Um, put if I got the fire going, I'd put the plastic garbage bag near the fire. Um, and it's again, it's probably what it's if it's sleeting, it's 32, 35 degrees, and so it's it's going to start to melt. Um, and uh, then then I get water. Next day, if the sun comes out, those plastic garbage bags um, are are. Um, uh, attract the sun, even though there's not a whole lot of sun in February in in Southeast Alaska. Uh, but you can use it. There's a little bit of thermal warmth there, and it'll continue to melt snow. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you, Don. You bet. Right on. All right. So let's. Um, I, when I used to teach survival, um, both at, at the University of Alaska and at Cornell University, uh, one of the big challenges was trying to figure out how to organize survival. What's what, how do we uh, think about um, a uh, coherent strategy for staying alive that can work generically in, in most situations? So um, thankfully, um, I wasn't the first person to ponder that. And there's an organization called the Alaska Marine Safety Education Association, otherwise known as AMSI. Uh, you can look amc.org and at the end there's a, a reference to to this wonderful organization uh, they were started back in the 70s or 80s in alaska uh, when commercial fishermen were dying all too commonly it's the most dangerous uh, occupation in america and in alaska you know the cold catch people have seen the tv shows it can be brutal out there um, and amc came up with seven steps to survival uh, a prioritization that worked at sea, worked on the coast, and I think works in, in almost all environments. I've added one step, um, but it, it allows us to uh, think about a, uh, a practical way to, to think about survival rather than bouncing all, all over the place. Um, I later taught for AMSI and um, uh, you know it, it, it's a really good organization. So let, let's take a look at these eight steps. Uh, again, based on, there's the AMC.org, uh, um, and while it's designed for, you know, temperate regions, I think it works, can work well for desert, uh, jungle, uh, where, wherever. 
All right, so these are the eight steps. Uh, prepare and prevent, that's the one I added. Uh, the rest of these are all courtesy of AMSI. Uh, recognition, inventory, shelter, signal, water, food, and play. Let's, let's take a look at them one at a time. What do we mean by this? All right, so um, the best survival situation is the one you don't have to endure. Um, that's, you wanna avoid trouble. You wanna stay out of survival situations. So how do we do that? Number one, research and outfit accordingly. You know, do some, you know, it's easy to research these days. Get online, find out what the weather is. What are the snow conditions, the avalanche hazard? Uh, what's the predicted weather? Um, are the bridges out? Are fires allowed? Are there forest fires? Um, so you wanna, wanna know all, fit, get that information be prepared for what uh, the conditions are. Accordingly, take the right clothing, the right equipment so that you can both be comfortable and have fun, but also obviously be safe. Number two, you wanna leave a trip plan. Uh, you wanna leave a trip plan uh, with somebody that's responsible, your spouse, your uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, your boss, uh, whomever uh, is a responsible party. And that trip plan is going to describe where you're going, um, when you're leaving, when you're due back, uh, your route, uh, who you're with, um, emergency phone numbers, and who should be contacted if you are if you don't get back at your specified time. Um, I always leave a, a good couple hour cushion in there because I don't want to be having uh, somebody call for search and rescue when I'm just running a little late. So I put a cushion in there, but there is a time where I'm asking people, hey, if I don't if I'm not back by um, 6 p.m. or midnight or whatever, uh, here's the, the number to call to alert the authorities so that they can start a search. So, and they'll know where to look. You know, again, in this, in our uh, Alaska case study, uh, hopefully the pilot uh, left a flight plan. Um, pilots are supposed to do that. They don't always do that, but if they leave a flight plan, then uh, the authorities know where to look uh, if if the flight's delayed coming back. So a trip plan can be really important. And then number three, use a buddy system. So a research shows that people alone do uh, much dumber things than when you've got somebody else with you, when you've got somebody to bounce ideas off of as to make sure you're not doing something that's, that's really uh, silly. Um, and that buddy can also go for help if need be. So a buddy system can be really helpful. Some of you may remember, I've seen that movie, uh, 127 Hours, about uh, Aaron Ralston, the young man that was out on a desert hike and a boulder rolled and pinned him. Um, he ended up, um, he had enormous guts, enormous, uh, I, I, I wouldn't have survived that situation. He basically eventually um, uh, had to saw off his own arm to, to survive, to, to get out of there. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's a harrowing story, a harrowing story, but he'd still have two arms if he had done what we, experts recommend. Uh, the two things is either left, left a trip plan or had a buddy and he didn't do either. And he ended up, it ended up costing him. Um, thankfully he survived through his, his strength and his persistence and guts. But, um, I, I don't know about you. I, I like, I like having four limbs. So leave a trip plan, use a buddy system, and uh, you can avoid those things. So um, let's move on to recognition. All right. Um, now, you know, in this case study we just had, um, excuse my French here, but no shit, Sherlock, that's a survival situation, right? The plane crashes, the pilot's dead, you're in the middle of Alaska wilderness. Yeah. Um, recognition, pretty clear, pretty easy to recognize you're in a survival situation. But that's not how most survival situations develop. Most survival situations, they're a, a series of cascading small mistakes and just bad luck. Um, you know, you you decide uh, you and your buddy are gonna go do a local mountain. Um, your buddy comes in from out of town, you go out for a beer or two, you have a good time, you stay out later than you, th you wanted, you have a couple too many beers maybe, you're a little hungover the next morning, you get up late, you forget to, you rush out of the house, you forget to get your raincoat, you head up into the mountains, you get hit by a thunderstorm. Um, where did that survival situation, where could you have, um, uh, recognize that this was not a good idea. You know, it could have been the night before that morning, you know, maybe rather than a climb, let's go watch a movie, let's go bowling. Let's, you know, the mountain's not going anywhere. So 
use good judgment, recognize uh, before it's a survival situation. Again, it's these, most of these are incremental. They, people just get slowly into more and more trouble um, and, and um, which it was perhaps preventable at, at some point. So listen to your gut. Don't be the one that's, that is afraid to mention that something doesn't seem right. And then every time the situation changes, uh, you know, recognize that you've got a, you've got a, uh, a different situation and um, be able to, to talk about that. All right, that's recognition. Our next step is inventory. And this is, you know, it used to be um, stop and smoke a cigarette. Um, obviously, that's not a healthy response to this, but the, the idea that you want to take a few moments and get your act together is really important here. This is when you're going to lay out all your cards. What do we have working for us? What do we have working against us? What, what equipment do we have? What supplies? What knowledge? What experience? Um, what knowledge do we have? Um, and then what do we have working against us? You know, the weather, injuries, um, uh, lack of, uh, of equipment, um, all of those, uh, uh, lay that out. You want to talk about is leadership, if that's an issue, um, who's in charge, what's, who, how are you going to work as a team? Uh, the extra 10 or 15 minutes to take care of this can, can pay dividends down the line rather than um, starting off and going in different directions because uh, the team's not singing off the same sheet of music. So inventory can be important. Shelters are first actual physical task that we're going to do. Uh, it, remember, it's more efficient to conserve energy than to create it. So clothing's our first line of defense. You want to protect from water and wind, anything to create dead airspace. Um, we used to teach, I mentioned earlier, using conifer boughs, spruce boughs, or pine boughs, leaves, uh, grasses. Um, and the prairie and the great in the prairies, they used to use sod in the Alaska. The miners used to use tundra chopped up into blocks, uh, snow, uh, snow caves, uh, igloos, um, anything that creates dead airspace can um, uh, help keep you warm and keep you protected from hypothermia um, and um, much easier to conserve that energy than it is to create it externally. And if you're not in the cold temperate zones or polar zones, then it may be shelter from uh, the, the sun, it may be shelter from wind or from other things, but shelter uh, is our first actual physical step. After shelter, uh, we're going to focus on signaling. And signaling is we need to, uh, since we're staying put, we need to bring help to us. The, that signal needs to stand out from the environment and it needs to send a message. Um, Remember, one big fire might be just seen as a bonfire, a party. Uh, threes of anything are the international distress signal. So three fires, three whistle blasts, three gunshots. Um, that's what you want to be thinking about. And then, uh, of course, electronics are awesome. Again, cell phones, you know, are a smart thing to always bring. Uh, you may have a, a satellite messenger, um, an inReach, something like that. Um, all of those are great, but you also want to have backup um, to your electronics. The single perhaps most um, useful signaling device, low tech, is a whistle. A whistle cuts through background noise. A whistle, um, if you start shouting for help, your voice is going to go uh, hoarse in a matter of an hour or two. You can whistle till the cows come home. Um, and that goes much further. It can cut through. So three blasts of whistles uh, repeated every couple of minutes. Um, that can work. A uh, signal mirror uh, can be seen up to 20 miles away. If you're above tree line, you're out on the water, uh, you're in the desert. Um, the, these low, uh, uh, a fire, as we've previously mentioned, all of these can be low tech signaling devices uh, in addition to the electronics. But stand out from the environment and send a message because we're staying put. We need to bring help to us. All right, so water um, is important. The longer you're out there, the more important it is. Uh, for most survival situations, it's probably not something you're going to have to worry too much about, because remember, you're hopefully you're gonna be rescued within that 26 to 28 hours. Um, if, you, if possible, you wanna boil water. Um, ideally, you wanna be consuming three to four liters a day. And it, after 24 hours, it can start to become critical. 
Um, if you are worried about the, the um, quality of the water, remember what we worry about mostly in North America is Giardia. Uh, and the incubation period for Giardia is 10 to 14 days. So um, if you're starting to get seriously dehydrated, drink water, drink what you can find. Um, that is, um, you'll, you can deal with uh, Giardia uh, a week or two weeks later um, back in civilization um, and um, uh, better, to, better to stay hydrated. If you are in a um, desert type uh, situation. Remember, it's uh, the experts say conserve sweat, not water. So you want to be thinking about uh, moving in the shade, moving at night, uh, if you are moving, um, and trying to minimize the amount of uh, work you do in the heat of the day. Foods, our next um, uh, item on our survival list. Again, um, uh, generally this is not gonna be a big deal. Uh, there's probably more nonsense written about uh, food procurement than anything else in the survival literature. Bottom line is uh, you wanna be thinking about, all right, if I'm gonna go out here trying to procure food, is, is it, I, I wanna have a reasonable expectation that I'm gonna be able to obtain more calories than I'm gonna expend going after those calories. Um, so it's seldom a real issue. If it is, then you want to think small. Think, um, you know, uh, bugs and, and grubs and roots and berries and grasses. Um, and then wa the water, uh, along water, whether it's a stream, a pond, or the ocean, that's where uh, you're most likely to find food that you can actually catch and use. Things like frogs, snakes, turtles, cattails. Uh, and then in the marine environment, uh, limpets, clams, uh, mussels, um, seaweed. And then our final step is play. And you know, you wonder, wow, this is a life and death situation. What the heck is play being uh, doing here? Um, a positive mental attitude is uh, the longer you're out there, the more important that becomes. And there's been lots of study, not studies, lots of examples in the survival literature where the, pers the people that survive aren't necessarily the young, healthiest, most robust, but the people that had that, that strong will to survive, that um, were determined to get through that situation, and they didn't give up. They didn't uh, let depression sink them. They kept busy. They didn't have a victim mentality. So this is anything to improve your situation. Uh, this is where you might want to set a snare, not because you think you've got a really good chance of capturing food, but it keeps you busy and um, it allows you to have some control over your situation. And then that mental play, um, prayer um, for those who are religious, thinking about loved ones, uh, sharing stories, um, anything to keep a positive attitude in yourself and in others. You've got to keep looking out for them as well. All right, so um, let's just summarize here. We talked about those eight steps to survival, um, pre pre prepare and uh, prevention, uh, recognition, inventory, shelter, signal, water, food, and play. Um, but again, prevention, prevention, preventions, the best survival situation is the one that doesn't happen. Um, you wanna stay put um, and stay together, all, all things being equal. Hypothermia is usually in our temperate areas, probably the big thing that's going to get you in trouble. So try to stay dry or get dry. Uh, if you can't do that, vapor barriers, things like tarps and garbage bags can be um, super helpful. Fire can be very helpful, but it's not critical. And so don't freak out if you can't get a fire started or keep one going. Uh, remember, shelter is more important in terms of warmth than a fire. Um, and then, you know, most survival situations last less than 48 hours. Uh, if you can get through that first night, you should be found. And then, you know, bottom line is that survival kit between your ears, that um, your knowledge, your experience, and that will to survive, that's as important as any of the, the concrete supplies or uh, uh, equipment that you might have, um, that mental, your mental status is, is critical. All right, I have droned on way too long here. I would love to throw it open to, well, there's some resources there you can look at, but throw it open to uh, questions. Right. Yes, so um, just as a reminder, I'm gonna be sending out the recording and the slides after the, so you'll have access to these resources, um, as well as uh, Todd's 
information here. So you'll have all that about 24 hours after the event. Um, all right, so Q&A. So we have about five minutes, so we'll try to go through these pretty quickly. Um, Pam asks, Dr. Miner, do you have any favorite survival books or movies? Um, yeah, you know, the uh, book that's really good is Hatchet. It's written for young adults. It's a really fast read, uh, written by a guy that uh, used, did the Iditarod, a uh, very um, realistic story. So Hatchet, um, it's a novel. In terms of um, non of survival manuals, um, Tom Brown's books are, are pretty good. Um, that would probably be my go-to. Uh, any Tom Brown's Wilderness Survival is a pretty good, uh, pretty good book. Okay, awesome. Thanks, Todd. All right, um, and then I think we already talked about this, um, but Sarah asked, would bear spray not be prudent to have in this survival situation? Um, yeah, okay, so good question. Um, animals are very low threats uh, in these situations, and then on top of that, uh, what time of year is this? February, ah, and what are bears doing? At least before climate change and global warming, uh, they're probably snoozing. So um, that one was kind of a, a ringer in there. Gotcha, thank you for that. Well, it could be, you know, you could use, spray it out on the um, snow and it is red and so it could be used for signaling. So all these things in, in the list would have some use uh, for sure. Okay, perfect. Um, and then Sarah also asked, if by some miracle you crashed near a cave or another, an other nature-created shelter, would you forego certain things like the raft tarp in favor of others? Uh, possibly, sure. Yeah, I mean, there's no, you know, absolutes on these. But yeah, if there was a, you know, a cave or a cabin that, you know, you just happened to crash by and you could access, then um, yeah, some of these things would definitely not, wouldn't, would, there'd be other things like the first aid kit, you know, might um, uh, move up the list if I had shelter taken care of. Okay, perfect. Um, I also just want to throw out that Kelly George from the WMS said that the WMS is doing a deep survival, uh, is doing deep survival for its October book club, and it focuses on why some survive and others don't. So that can be really interesting. To read for it's folks. a great, and it's a great book. Um, uh, the, the guy that wrote that knows his stuff. Um, so that would be, Deep Survival would be an, another, I've got it here on my shelf right next to me somewhere. Um, that would be good. And then, um, or come to the uh, winter meeting and I'll be doing a workshop on uh, snow shelters and you can, we can build, we do snow caves, igloos, uh, quin well, we don't do igloos. We start igloos, uh, quinzies, so lots of different shelters. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, that sounds so fun. I'll look into it. Um, yes. Be a kid again. Oh yeah, I love that kind of stuff. Uh, Samantha asked, what certifications do you recommend for medical professionals who wish to work with outfitters and organizations in their area? Wow, yeah, uh, good question. So the, the FOM, the Fellowship of the Academy of Wilderness Medicine is, an, is a really good certificate. It's still not as well known as it should be, um, but it definitely lets um, decision makers and those in our field know that if you've done that, you you are um, solid in terms of your wilderness medicine knowledge, both uh, mainly in breadth. Um, there's a lot of people that consider themselves experts that um, are kind of scary sometimes. And the FOM, um, the Fellowship of Academy of Wilderness Medicine or FOM, uh, is a great way to um, uh, recognize that somebody ha has done their due diligence in studying the subject. Yes. And just to clarify for everyone that's offered through the WMS. Yeah. Yep. Um, and by the way, we have not mentioned this yet, but if you, um, the WMS actually gave us a discount code for anyone who wished to join them, um, that comes from any of our events. And Kelly, uh, can you type it in the chat? It's, is it WMSRN? Is that correct? Um, I don't know if she stepped away. Well, but how come I didn't get that discount, Kelly? <laughs> so she just put it in the chat. It's WMSRN. And so if you, um, they are, the, like she said, the leading org organization for wilderness medicine. So Lisa also asked, um, are there any other courses for nurses on survival skills and clinical skills in the wilderness? I think the WMS is a great place to start. Todd, I don't know if you have anything else to add there. That would be, that would be my suggestion is the, uh, there's, the winter and summer conferences, there's a desert conference, there's a med sale, there's a dive. Uh, so there's lots of different aspects. Um, I do, I lead a desert um, uh, canyon country 
uh, workshop for through WMS in the f spring and the fall. Um, we talk a lot about survival in those classes and, and teach skills. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you, Todd. Well, um, we're right at the end. We actually are a little over, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up. But Todd, thank you so much. This was My amazing. Pleasure. I learned more from this, I think, than um, any of the other classes combined. So now I know what to do. Um, I do want to add that Kelly um, sent me over some great resources, including Todd's uh, Canyon Country Adventure Trip. She just linked to it in the chat, but I'll include that in the follow-up email if you, any of you are interested in attending that. Um, you will also receive an email with a post-event survey. If you would please complete that and let us know what the next uh, wilderness medicine topic you'd like for us to cover, that would be great. Also, we really take this feedback seriously, so it's really helpful for me and to, to my team uh, so we know how to improve. But um, I'd love to give a huge round of virtual applause to Todd. Thank you so much, and thank you to Kelly from the WMS. This has been a wonderful partnership, and I can't wait to see what we do next. So um, everyone have a great night, and um, look out for those emails for me, and I hope to see you at one of our next events.